In order to understand the methodology that changed it all, we are going to follow this roadmap. First, we are going to understand what are three sigma control charts. Secondly, how to select the right control chart. Then we're going to make a control chart. And finally, how to read the results that control charts are communicating to us. So let us start with the first item. What are three sigma control charts? And what you will learn in this lecture is what does it mean to have a process in control? How control charts contribute to eliminate what we call abnormal variation? And lastly, to describe the different types of control charts. Here we go. What makes a process in control? Well, first of all, the process it is predictable. We can predict the future based on what happened in the past. No surprises whatsoever. Secondly, it is possible to address any issues before they get out of control. So on a certain way, it's an alarm system. It's a preventive system. We read signals that tell us, hey, be careful, something wrong is about to happen before it happens. So in order to understand process control, we need to understand process performance. And what you see here is a bearing. This bearing has some controls. It has an internal control diameter of 6.35 millimeters. It also has a control external diameter of 17.46 millimeters. It also has a width, which is also control, of 7.93 millimeters. So now let us assume that we are going to mass produce this item, huge volumes, and we are going to start measuring these specifications. This is what we are going to experience. And let's just take, for example, the internal diameter. As soon as we start manufacturing and start measuring, what we are going to notice is the presence of variation. And this variation also behaves on a certain manner, on a certain predictable manner, which we call normal variation, a normal distribution that can be modeled in this way. This picture that you see here is the central limit theorem, and this is also known as the Gauss or normal distribution. So we see we have our nominal value with certain items that fall, certain measurements that fall within one sigma level, two sigma level, and three sigma level of variation. So we have some parts that are very far away from the target. That is okay because most of the parts are located here. They are gravitating in our nominal value. So the central limit theorem tell us that 68% of the parts are within a plus one, plus minus one sigma area. The 95% of our parts will be located within the minus two plus two sigma and almost 100 parts, 100% of our parts, 99.7 will be located within the minus three and plus three sigma level. So now you take that concept and let us build what we call a run chart. So once again, we have the same data, but now by means of a timeline. So what we're going to see is how that distribution behaves. And we notice how the data gravitates mostly and hopefully in the center, in the average, ideally in the nominal value of that 6.35 millimeters. But we also see the presence of that variation. So in other words, here is our nominal value and that is our process mean. And these are our levels of variation. These limits, the three and minus three sigma are what we call the upper and the lower control limits of our process. All right, so how can we find our three sigma control limits? Very simple. The first step 
is to estimate the standard deviation of our sample. Once we have that standard deviation, we had to multiply by three, three times, three sigma, and we have to add or deduct from the process mean. So in other words, the upper control limit is the process mean plus three times the standard deviation of our sample and the lower control limit is again the same process mean minus three times the standard deviation. All right, so, so far that is with regards all the statistics behind the concept of process performance, but the question remains, why using control charts? Well, let me explain you why. First, all processes have variations. Variations cause quality problems. Variations create the pain to our customers. Therefore, assessing these variations can help in preventing quality problems. So it is very important to understand what kind of variation it is present in our process. Okay, so in understanding variation, we need to distinguish between these two types, natural variation and assignable variation. So what is natural variation? Natural variation is basically the one that is embedded in nature. It's random, it's unavoidable, yet it's predictable. So the causes are the ones that you see here, uh, the weather, the measurement accuracy, to name a few. With regards to assignable variation, that is completely a different type of story. That is definitely not random, is preventable because it is created by factors that have to be investigated, a special situation, let's call them like that, very often caused by not following standards. So what could be the causes? For example, tool wear, fatigue, distraction of our operators, etc., etc. All right, so in order to assess that variation, we need to make a chart and that chart will depend on the type of data that we are monitoring. So what you see here are the two big families of data. On the left side, we have the discrete data. On the right, the continuous data. So discrete data is the one that we count or classify as A, B, C, red, blue, yellow, uh, good or bad number of defects per unit. And for this type of data, we have the following charts. We have the so-called C chart, U chart, P chart, and NP chart. For continuous data, that is the one that we actually measure. This is the full spectrum of data, such as weight, distance, temperature, etc. Once again, we also have a collection of options depending on the sample size. We have IMR, we have X bar R charts. We also have X bar S charts. A question that we encounter very often is the following you get to see here. Does having a process in control means that we meet our customer expectations? What do you think about that question? Well, the answer is no. No, that is not enough. Having a process that is predictable is something that is good, but it doesn't mean that it's effective. Let me show you why. What you see here is a visual. On the left side is the process performance. That is the voice of the process. And on the right side, these are the specification limits given by our customer. We call them the voice of the customer. So we get to see how these two are pretty much aligned because uh, most of our data is basically gravitating not only on the process performance, but also on the target value. All the data, all the variation is within the tolerance limit. So this is the ideal case. It's a process that is predictable, is meeting the customer expectations. But, you know, sometimes it's not always the case. Sometimes we have the following situation. So what you see here now is a misalignment. And although the variation is not that dangerous because it's, it, we are still performing within the tolerance and our process is predictable, 
most of our results are in the upper limit of the tolerance and that is not really that good what we need to do is to enforce this process to somehow align it with that target and this example just shows you one of the limitations of process control charts so process control charts are a great tool to assess process performance but we need to have always this big overview everything has to be customer centric don't forget that so having said that i wish you a nice day wherever you are and looking forward for the next lesson bye bye